the topic today is about construction. How many here have construction experience? Wow, quite a bit. If I ask this in my church, there'll be no hands raised. <laughs> so our church is very <laughs> uh, terrible when it comes to construction, both young and old. That's going to be our topic today, and we're going to focus in on the construction of Jerusalem. Um, but before we, we get there, before we talk about Nehemiah, before we talk about construction, I have a friend who is in the real estate business, and he's always posting construction fails on his Facebook page. It cracks me up each time I see it, because I'm thinking to myself, how could they build it that way? Were they not thinking? And obviously they weren't, because if they were, it would not fail. So here's a couple of examples I want to show you. If you can move on to the next slide. It's not, not working. So that's the first one. <clears throat> it cracked me up. I'm like, if you paid money to go to a game and that's the seat you got, it's terrible, right? Who, who did that? I mean, they could have just not put that seat there. But uh, <laughs> I don't know what that guy did for the rest of the game because that, that's not a good place to be at. Can you go to the next slide? So that, that one is kind of scary looking, right? Um, I don't know how that cars are going through without looking at the traffic light. I was trying to figure out where this was. I'm betting you it's in some Asian country. <laughs> well, that's terrible. Whoever put that there or whoever built that overhead bridge completely blocked um, traffic. Here's the next one. This one's really bad, okay? I, I don't know which one got built first, the stairs or the house, uh, but it, you can't walk out a door without falling four floors or walk up the stairs and hit a wall. <laughs> and the next one, this is the last one. We, we got to have a bathroom fail, right? Those are the funniest. So I'm not sure which country this is. They probably have really long arms. But if I, I try to use this, I, I don't think I could reach it. <laughs> Even if I try to, like, stand up and reach that, it's not going to happen. <laughs> but we, you know, these are really funny to, to look at because they're just construction fails. But as we dive into God's Word today, um, one of the things that I don't want to do is to fail when I'm uh, building the kingdom of God, right? We're all called to be kingdom builders, and I would hate to see us failing um, in building God's kingdom. And so one of the things that we're going to dive into today is asking the question, well, what does successful kingdom building look like? Right? If we're all called to be kingdom builders, then what are some principles? What are some of those things that would help us and be the guardrails for us to be successful kingdom builders? And what are those things that would cause us to be failures, like kingdom building fails, right? We don't want this to be happening in uh, the church. We don't want it to be happening in our lives. We don't want it to be happening globally. So that's what we're going to dissect as we go into Nehemiah uh, chapter 3 today. So if you will flip with me to Nehemiah chapter 3, whether it's through your Bible or through your phone app, Nehemiah chapter 3. So in the back of our mind, as we're going through this passage, we want to be thinking, what are those biblical principles that would help us be successful kingdom builders? And what are some of those things that would cause us to fail as a kingdom builder? Now, let me give you some context before we go into um, chapter 3. So the book of Nehemiah, if we think uh, from a biblical timeline perspective, is actually one of the very last uh, events before it switches over to the New Testament. But if you look at the book of Nehemiah, it's kind of in the middle of the Old Testament. Um, Nehemiah time was during the Persian Empire. Um, at that point, it's been about 100 years since the Babylon Empire had taken over. Persian then overtook the Babylon Empire. There's been several waves of Jews that have gone back to Jerusalem. You know, These are the remnants, the exiles. They've gone back to Jerusalem to start building their lives again, to rediscover what it means to be a Jew and to worship the Lord. But we're going to find that they're actually not in a very good space uh, at this point in time when Nehemiah comes into the scene. Um, if you look at chapter 1 and 2, 
it talks about Nehemiah's brothers coming to him in Susa. And so he's about 1,700 miles away from Jerusalem in Susa. He's a cupbearer to the king. And so he's essentially a human food poison detector. So he, he drinks before the king drinks. He eats before the king eats so that if there's any poison in it, he dies first. That's a terrible job. But that's what he was doing. Um, and so his brothers come and tell him that, hey, Jerusalem is in a terrible state. Not only are the walls and the gates all broken and burnt, uh, the Jewish people who were living there at that time were emotionally broken. They were spiritually broken. And so when Nehemiah heard this news from his brothers, he broke down and wept and prayed and fasted and mourned. His heart was just broken for his people. And so then he went to the king and asked for permission to go back to Jerusalem to rebuild the walls and rebuild the gates. And so that's where we are at in Nehemiah 3 today is it's going to be a long list of just the different things they're working on, the names of the people working on it, the kind of profession they are. Um, and then it also talks about uh, what are some of the things that they did there. So most of the time when we see like genealogy or when we see like names, we just check out. But I would challenge you today to say, hey, when even though we're looking at names and places, there's a lot of biblical truth in here that would help us be good kingdom builders, successful kingdom builders. And so what I'm going to do is um, very quickly do like a running commentary of Nehemiah chapter 3. So I'm totally going to butcher all the names, especially with my Malaysian accent. It's going to make it worse. <laughs> But at least I can blame my accent, right? It's just the Malaysian accent. So we're going to read through it, and I want to highlight things in here, just point things out. And when we're done reading the passage, I want us to look at a couple biblical truths that would help us be successful kingdom builders, okay? All right, so flip your Bible to Nehemiah chapter 3. We're going to read it. Well, I'll read it. You guys can follow along. But um, I want to show you the map so that you get some bearings. If you all can flip to the slide with the map right there. So as we're reading Nehemiah chapter 3, the way this is going to happen is you see the sheep's gate up top. So the Jerusalem uh, city is right there. You see the, the wall that surrounds it. And the sheep's gate is up top, right? Way up north, right there. So this passage is going to start there. Then it's going to go counterclockwise. It's going to talk about the sheep gates and who did what. And it's going to go to the fish gate and who did what. And the Jashana gate. So it starts going um, in a counterclockwise fashion to let us know who's doing what, when, with who, what exactly are they doing. Um, there's a lot of biblical truth in this that we can uh, extract from. And then as we're going through this, you'll see the map on the right. What you'll notice is not only people in Jerusalem, that's where the yellow star is, not only are the people in the city working on this, but you're going to start seeing people from like Jericho or Bethlehem and surrounding areas. They're all pouring into the city to help build um, Jerusalem again. And so I'm going to point all that stuff out to you, and uh, let's, let's get into it. So Nehemiah chapter 3, verse 1. Eliashib, the high priest, and his fellow priests went to work and rebuilt the sheep's gate. So remember the one up north right there. They dedicated it and set its door in place, building as far as the Tower of the Hundred, which they dedicated, and as far as the Tower of Hananel. The men of Jericho built the adjoining section, and Zakor, son of Imri, built next to them. The Sheep Gate is normally where they would do the sacrifices, which makes sense because that's near the temple. You guys see the temple is up north. And so they would bring the sheep, the bulls, and, and all of that through that gate to go into the temple for sacrifices. And I love that the high priest is the one that kicks off this work. Even though Nehemiah is the one orchestrating it, it's the high priest that started it. You know, spiritual leaders. Think about Josh. When the work of God needs to happen, I love it when the spiritual leaders gets their hands dirty and leads their team first. That's what Josh is doing there. And we want to praise God for that and for his leadership and continue to pray for him. But that's the first thing I want to point out is the, the spiritual leaders kick this off. Verse 3, the fish gate, which is the one on the left, so they start moving counterclockwise. The fish gate was rebuilt by the sons of 
Hasana, they laid its beams and put its door and bolts and bars in place. Merimoth, son of Uriah, and the son of Hakaz, repaired the next section. Next to him, Meshulam, son of Barakiah, the son of Meshabel, made repairs. Next to him, Zadok, son of, I was going to read this, a banana. Banna also made repairs. The next section was repaired by the men of Tekoa, but their nobles would not put their shoulders to the work under their supervision. So the fish gate is normally where the Sea of Galilee, it kind of faces that way. And so all the fishermen would bring their fish and whatever they catch uh, in the Sea of Galilee through that gate. But I want you to see very beginning, like just right off the bat, there are already people who don't want to do the work, right? You already see resistance. You already see people who say, now that's beneath me. I don't want to do it. Uh, verse 6, the Jeshana gate was repaired by Joida, son of Pasheah, and Mehulam, son of Bosadiah. They laid its beams and put its door with their bolts and bars in place. Next to them, repairs were made by men from Gibeon and Mishpah. So those are guys from around. They're not from Jerusalem, but they're traveling in. Um, Malatiah of Gibeon and Jadon of Meronoth, placed under the authority of the governor of Trans Euphrates. Uziel, son of Haraniah, one of the goldsmiths, repaired the next section. And Hananiah, one of the perfume makers, made repairs next to that. They restored Jerusalem as far as the broad wall. Rapahiah, son of Hur, ruler of half district of Jerusalem, repaired the next section. Adjoining this, Jediah, son of Haruma, made repairs opposite to his house. And Hattush, son of Hashbaniah, made repairs next to him. Melchijah, son of Hariah. And Heshub, son of Moab, <laughs> man, these Hebrew names are, repair another section and the Tower of Owens. Shalom, son of Halosheh, ruler of a half district of Jerusalem, repaired the next section with the help of daughters. This section is interesting because it starts talking about the professions. It says the goldsmiths started coming in, the perfume makers, even the rulers started coming in, and they're getting their hands dirty. Verse 13, the valley gate was repaired by Hanum and the residents of Zoniah. The valley gate is just a gate that faces the valley. They rebuilt it and put his doors on the bolts and bars in place. They also replaced a thousand cubits of the wall as far as the dung gate. The next gate, verse 14, the dung gate. Do I need to explain this? No. <laughs> uh, that's why the animals, the humans, and the trash all went, okay? was repaired by Malkijah, son of Rehab, ruler of the district of Beth Hakram. He rebuilt it and put its door with their bolt and bar in place. I wonder why it's just one guy that's working on the dung gate. This cracks me up the most. At least he's brave and courageous enough to be doing this. Everyone else was working around it. Uh, verse 15, the fountain gate. Uh, this is where the pool of Shiloh is, and um, this is where they would normally do Take the water for temple cleansing. Uh, the fountain gate was repaired by Shalom, son of Kol Jose, ruler of the district of Mishpah. He rebuilt it, roofing it over and putting its doors and bolts and bars in place. He also repaired the walls of the pool of Shalom by the king's garden as far as the steps going down from the city of David. Beyond him, Nehemiah, son of Azbuk, ruler of a half district of Beth Zur, made repairs up to a point opposite the tombs of David as far as the artificial pool and the house of the heroes. Next to him, the repairs were made by the Levites and the Rehum son of Bani. Beside him, Hashiba, ruler of half district of Kela, carried out repairs for his district. Next to him, the repairs were made by their fellow Levites and the Binui, son of Hanadab. All right, this kind of goes on for a while here. Uh, but what I want to point out is they not only started working on the gates and the wall, they started working on the armory in verse 19. They started working in verse 20 on houses. Um, they also started working on courts and towers. So this passage in the fountain gates, they started expanding their work. Um, verse 26, the water gate towards the east and the projecting tower. So this is where there's spring water, and that's why it's called the water gate. Next to them, the men of Tekoa repaired another section from the great projecting tower to the wall of Ophel. Verse 28, above the horse gate. So the horse gate is where the king's stable is, and that's where all, all the horses are. 
the priest made repairs, each in front of his own house. Next to them, Zadok, son of Immer, made repairs opposite his house. Next to him, Shemaiah, son of Shechaniah, the guard at the east gate, made repairs. So they're moving towards the east gate. The east gate is um, where the Mount of Olives is. So it faces the Mount of Olives. Uh, verse 30, next to him, Hananiah, son of Shelemiah, and Hanum, the sixth son of Zelph, repair another section. Next to them, Melisham, son of Barakiah, made repairs opposite his living quarters. Next to him, Malkajah, one of the goldsmith, made repairs as far as the house of the temple servants and the merchants opposite the inspection gate. The inspection gate is where the, um, the king's military is normally at, and the king would go out and inspect his military. Um, verse uh, 31, the inspection gate, and as far as the room above the corner, verse 32, and between the room above the corner and the sheep gate, the goldsmith and merchant made repair. So we went one whole circle, we pointed out some of the important things, and I think this is where we want to start thinking about, all right, all I heard was things that got built, people's professions, names of people. How does that help us see what it means to be a better kingdom builder in the kingdom of God, right? And so here's a couple of things that I want to point out, two things specifically. You can move to the next slide. So the first question we want to ask ourselves as we kind of digest and unpack this passage is to ask the question, are we willing to do whatever it takes to be a kingdom builder? Are we willing to do whatever it takes to be a kingdom builder? Now, one of the things that you'll notice in this passage is no one here was mentioned as a construction worker. Right? They were priests. Um, they were high priests. They were temple servants. I mean, these guys' hands are soft. Right? They just stay indoors and do uh, religious ceremony. So they're not used to going out and doing construction work. Then we also see goldsmiths and perfume makers and merchants. These guys don't go out and do construction work, right? They're used to luxury. They have money. They're smelling fragrance every day, not stinky mud. And then we also see um, there are men. Um, there's one here where the guy brought his daughters um, to go do the work. That's awesome, right? And so what we see here is these are not professional construction workers, but yet they were willing to do whatever it took to rebuild the walls and the gates in Jerusalem. And it came at a personal cost. I also want us to see that from this passage. The high priests, like I said, their hands are probably soft. They're not used to carrying rocks. They're not used to um, just doing hard labor. Same thing for the governors and the rulers. Right? It says the governors came out, their sons came out. They were all doing hard work. And the sacrifices for the rulers and governors, I think, is reputational loss. Right? Other places are going to look at them and say, hey, you're a ruler here, you're a governor. Why are you doing like a low man's work? Right? They have reputational loss. Um, they're going to get ridiculed for what they're doing. In fact, we see later in the next couple um, chapters, they do get ridiculed for what they're doing. So these rulers, these leaders, they're getting their hands dirty at personal sacrifice. We think about the, um, the goldsmiths and the perfume makers. I mean, these folks had to shut down their business. For the duration, they had to go build the walls. And so there were economic uh, sacrifice that they had to do. Um, we can go on and on, but I think what we can look from this passage is that, number one, none of these guys were professionals. And number two, it came at a cost. And so for us, you know, what does that mean? Many times when we do kingdom work, normally the first thing that we think about is, oh, I'm not cut out for this kind of work. You know, I don't know how to share the gospel. Um, I don't know how to lead a Bible study. I don't know how to do all these things. I'm not a professional pastor like Pastor Josh. All of us have those thoughts initially when God calls us to do kingdom work just like these guys, but I hope that when we read this and we see their willingness to just get in there and be fellow builders in the kingdom of God, that should inspire us and say, hey, we really shouldn't say just because I don't know how to do it or this is below me, shouldn't be a, an excuse for us to not do kingdom work. And then the second thing is uh, personal cost, right? I mean, you all are here, 
I know some of you showed up two hours before the service to do a lot of setup work, you're practicing. I mean, it came at a cost. You could have slept additional two hours. Or right now, you could be out shopping or doing something else. But you're choosing to do God's work. And that is a deliberate choice that you have to make at a personal cost. Um, I want to read a couple of Bible passages here that talks about doing whatever it takes to build the kingdom of God. The first one is from Romans chapter 3, verse 23 to 25. Romans chapter 3, verse 23 to 25. It says this, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and all are justified freely by His grace through the redemption that came from Christ Jesus. Pay attention to verse 25. God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of his blood to be received by faith. Sometimes like, I, I look at passages like this. I don't know how I can comprehend what God the Father did because he did whatever it took. And in this case, he sacrificed his one and only son, Jesus Christ. It blows my mind. So my son's uh, a freshman in UVA. And so if you ask me, Carter, would there be anything that you would not be willing to do when you are being a kingdom builder? I think if God were to ask me to sacrifice my son, I would have a very hard time, very hard time saying, yes, I will sacrifice my son. But this is the extent which God would go to save us from our fallen nature, our sin. He went all the way, sacrificing his son, Jesus Christ, right, to die, to resurrect so that we may have life in him. And so are you willing to take whatever it takes to be a kingdom builder? Here's another passage. This is from uh, the book of Mark, chapter 8, verse 34 to 35. Mark 8, 34 to 35. And this is Jesus talking. It says, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. Whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever lose their life for me and for the gospel will save it. So Jesus is saying, as a kingdom builder, we have to, even to the extent of saying, I'm willing to put my life down for the gospel. That's a lot to ask from someone, right? If it's material stuff like if I give a thousand bucks or if I have to give my car or give up my house, you know, go to a foreign land, sure. But to, to the extent of giving up my life, a lot of us would have a hard time doing that. And so I think this is the radical call of Jesus Christ, right? He's saying to be a kingdom builder, everything should be on the table, just like what God the Father did. And when we follow Christ and we claim to be disciples of Christ, then we must deny ourselves, carry the cross, even to the point where we have to say, I will lose my life so that I may gain the life that Jesus has given me. So when I think about construction, our church actually went on a construction mission trip. This was right before COVID happened, and those are the pictures there. Um, I will have to admit I had very negative views about construction mission trips because I don't view them as mission trips. Um, in my mind, when you go on mission trip, it's, it's sort of like what Pastor Josh and his team is doing right now, right? You're going to a church, you're going to a church plant, and that's mission. Uh, so up till this construction mission trip, we were working with like the North American Mission Board. Uh, we were working with various church planters around the East Coast. So we were sending teams there to help the church planters. But this particular year, um, Hurricane Florence kind of hit. And so we said, instead of doing a church plan, let's go and help rebuild the lives of some of these folks that have lost their homes and everything. Um, I was kind of, I was still a little hesitant calling it a mission trip, but I said, fine, we'll go, we'll do construction, um, and then we'll see what happens. Um, the other thing that made me hesitate going on this trip was we had a couple kids who were not Christian. Um, their friends from church had invited them over, um, and they wanted to go. They are like, well, this is construction, I'm, I'm willing to go, right? Normally, when we go and do church planting, non-Christians would not want to go because you're going out and sharing the gospel. And so it kind of blew my mind that non-Christians would want to go on a construction mission trip. 
Uh, and so we had, I finally said yes, even though I hesitated a couple times. So we went there and we did all kinds of construction work. I will tell you, Asians don't do construction work well, just because we, we don't grow up in that culture of like do it yourself. And most Asian parents tell their kids to like study. Uh, this is like the stereotypical Asian, right? Study, study, everything else you don't need to worry about. And that is true for, church, for our church. Uh, it's, I'm kind of ashamed to admit that, but our kids are all softies, okay? They're softies. They've never like laid their hands on heavy things. None of them have touched a tool up till this construction project. And so when we sent uh, pictures of like, that's Katie right there, of her using a power saw, uh, my wife did the mistake of sending this to the parents and said, hey, look at all the awesome things we're doing. Uh, Katie's mom freaked out. So she <laughs> messaged my wife and said, can you please not let my daughter uh, handle power tools? And we said, we'll consider it. <laughs> so for the rest of the week, she did use the power tool. And there were other things that our youth were doing that we didn't want to send the parents. But hey, everyone didn't, they, they came back safe. Nobody lost any body parts. But it was a rough week. I will tell you, uh, it like I said, none of us were professionals. Like my wife, she's a business analyst. She works at Capital One. Uh, Michael Rogers, way at the back, he's a detective with Chesterfield County. Um, Sun Hui is a stay-at-home mom. You know, I was a pastor at that time. I'm still not very good with tools, uh, even with the international board, mission board. My work there is more technology-driven. And so none of us were professionals. Like I said, the youth were terrible. They were definitely not uh, construction professionals. But we went and, and we did it. And it came at a personal cost too, right? We had to travel there. We had to take vacations. That week was a um, heat advisory. It was 100 degrees every single day that week. Uh, my son did roofing work. <laughs> His shoes started melting. And so <laughs> it was insane. And the, uh, the facility we were staying in was a last-minute facility. The church that was supposed to house us ended up not doing it. So we had to stay in this broken down camp and there wasn't any AC and we were sleeping with like fans blowing in our face. It was rough. But here's what happened, right? We did whatever it took that week. Despite my um, short-sightedness around God's kingdom and literally building the kingdom of God, this is what God did and it shocked me. So you'll see that little triangle there. There are three kids' face. So the one up top, his name is Eric. The one below on the left is Laura. The brothers and sisters. So these are the two that were not Christians. And they went and they heard the gospel. And after the mission trip, they started coming to our church. Yeah. The, yes, clap for the Lord. This is all his work. He shocked me. And then the one on the right, that's Grace. She's a high schooler. She's in college now. But she... During, like, one of the last evenings there, uh, during the camp, the camp counselor uh, did communion. And so he said, you know, whoever um, have accepted Christ, come on up and, and join us in communion. And so I saw for the front of my eye, Grace stood up and started walking towards the communion table. And I walked up to her and said, hey, Grace, you're not a Christian. You've not accepted Christ Jesus. What are you doing walking up here to do communion? And she said, you know, Pastor Carter, I've heard the gospel the whole week. I've seen how the community of Christ interacts, not just in our church, but between the churches that were there. And she said, you know, the Lord really touched me um, this week, and I want to accept Christ. And so I said, are you sure you know what this means? And so I read her some Bible passages. And she said, yes, that's what I want to do. And so while we were in line, as the line was moving, I prayed with her the sinner's prayer. And she accepted Christ right there and there. And within a few seconds, she took communion. It blew my mind that this actually happened. Um, and so, you know, sometimes I think we think about, oh, I'm giving up all these things. This is my personal sacrifice. But that doesn't compare at all to when God works, right, in those situations. And you see things like these happen and you go, Wow. This is insane that God could work in such a way that completely blows my mind. And so we go back to the question, are you willing to do whatever it takes? And I will tell you, when you say yes to that question, God will blow your mind. Because you, 
all of us, myself included, have a very narrow mind, but his thoughts are greater, right? Always. All right, so let's move on to the next question. The second question in the next slide. Looks like it's trying to do something. <laughs> oh, wow. Are you willing to build alongside other kingdom builders? It shouldn't surprise us that when we look at Nehemiah 3, there's literally like 30 mentions of he built beside this person or they built beside this guy or this guy built alongside that person. So many mentions of that, of people building beside each other. And uh, this is the time where I have a quiz for you. And I actually bought church merch. It's from my church. It's not as nice as the Way Church t-shirt, which I see Pastor Josh like wear every day of every moment. <laughs> Literally everywhere I see him, whether it's church or not, he's wearing the Way Church t-shirt. But I have four here, so we're going to do a little quiz and a poll, okay? Uh, what I like to do is, can I get a runner? Can you be a runner for me? No? All right. I just need a runner, someone that can help me. Else I'll be like throwing this at people, Okay. <laughs> So I have four pictures that I'm going to show you regarding the partnership that Grace Chinese Baptist with the Way Church have had over the years. Um, and then what I want you to do is guess where that is. Okay, just guess the location of where that is. If you get us it right, you get a merch, a t-shirt, and a cool GCBCR pen. All right, first one. Oh, very close. Don't quite. Oh, you got it. What's your name? Lauren. All right, Lauren got it. It was launch day at Godwin High School. Good job here. Thank you. <laughs> All right. The t-shirts are various sizes, so feel free to kind of like trade with each other afterwards. Next one. Yes, you got it. So this was a couple months in, and um, Pastor Josh was asking, hey, can you guys come and help us with the kids' ministry? So we sent a team over to help you guys. Um, my son was troubleshooting the TV, if you can see that. Like, it wasn't working. He was trying to figure it out. And then we have Josiah and Emily helping out with the kids. So this was at the SPCV building. All right, next, next picture. Josh's house, close but not quite. It's outdoor and that's a baptism pool. That, those are clues. At Salem, no. At, oh, who said that? Yes, it was at my church. Yeah. Can I just throw this? It would be so much more fun to throw it. All right, I'll throw the last one and hope I don't hit a chandelier, okay? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so this was at our church. Uh, this was during COVID, and I told Pastor Josh we didn't feel safe doing baptism in the church, uh, dipping everyone in the same pool. And so he said, hey, I have an outdoor baptism pool. Do you want to borrow it? And I said, yeah. So he delivered it over, and we baptized uh, several of our high school girls. Okay, here's the next one. Oh, who said that? It, that's partially right on YouTube. Yes, who said that? Oh, my gosh. Are we really going to do this? Okay. Um, <laughs> the two right in front of him might want to watch out. All right, here we go. Oh! All right, I don't have a strong arm. <laughs> it was close, close. All right, the reason I show you all these pictures is I just want to tell you that the way church has uh, just partnership built into your DNA. And I'm going to talk about this a little bit uh, later as well. But I just love how your church is always out in the community, partnering with others. How you're right now sending a team to Puerto Rico, partnering with the church there. And, you know, that's one of the things we see in, in Nehemiah 3 is the willingness to build beside each other. They're working with someone else. The rulers were working with the perfume makers, right? The guys were working with the girls. Um, you got the governors working with the priests. And so there has to be a willingness for us to work together and not to say we are the way church, but also be thinking 
kingdom, right? We are the universal church, um, a larger church. Every single Christian in this world is part of that universal church. And so here's a couple of Bible passages I want, I want to read that really hones in on this point um, of being willing to work with others. In Matthew 28, verse 19, this is the Great Commission passage. It should be familiar to all of us. Matthew 28, verse 19, it says, Therefore go and make disciples, pay attention, to all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. So if our commission by God is to go out to all nations, be expecting you'll be working with people that you never worked with before. Or sometimes you go like, oh, I'm not sure if I want to work with this person. But we are all called to work with each other. In Revelation 7, 9, this is the, um, this is the mission statement of, at the IMB. Revelation 7, 9. It says, After this I looked, and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count, from every nation, tribe, people, and language, standing before the throne and before the Lamb. You know, this is what we're called to. At the end of the day, when we are all with the Lord, we're going to look and see a multitude. All nations, all tribe, all people, all language. So we have to be willing to be working with others at all times because our commission is to go out to the world, work with all people, all tribe, all language, all nations. And so I just love that this church already has that DNA. You, know, you guys are really blessed. I will tell you, I know of churches who focus is very inward. And so they don't really want to partner with other people, uh, nor do they want to go out. Um, their focus is very much inside, taking care of their people. And churches like that implode because they've forgotten their purpose. The purpose of a church is for the non-members of the church, right? Isn't that insane? Most organizations, they exist for people in the organization. But the church exists for people who are outside of that organization. Right? We're called to reach people outside of the church. And so don't ever forget that. Uh, I remember during the launch um, in Godwin High School, Pastor Josh ended his service by commissioning everyone out and saying, you are not commissioned out in your schools, in your neighborhoods, in your workplaces. You know, bring the Great Commission to those places and work with the other Christians that are there to rebuild the kingdom of God. Okay. So, everyone should have a piece of that on their chair. Next slide, please. So, here's the challenge for each of you, okay? Which part of the wall in the way church and God's kingdom will you build? Whose shoulder will you build next to? Um, we know in the book of Nehemiah, they were building like an actual wall and gate. But for us as Christians this day, that's not the truth. You know, maybe we're working on a construction project, but most of the time we're building the kingdom of God through people. And so in this, you have like the front and the back. And this is from your website. I hope you've seen this on your website. Okay, Someone took a lot of work to build this. So I want to point a couple things here. Um, in this one, that's the connect card. So when you go to your website and you, you fill in a form, you'll see this. So each one of the item here that's boxed in yellow, it's a way for you to be involved. It's a way for you to help build the wall of this church. So look at the, the circle around the way church, right? What kind of ministry can you be involved in? The next one, connect card. Are you a tech person that can help do the website? Or can you be the face of the connection? So when someone fills in this connect card, you reach out to them. That is also a ministry. If you keep moving down, there's um, sharing my life, committing my life to Christ. So are there anyone here who would be willing to have those conversations with folks who are exploring Christianity? Um, next one down, next steps. It literally lists every single thing on here that your church uh, ministry has that you can be part of to help build up that ministry. Whether that's community groups or discipleship groups or serving teams, you go down that list. Every single one of those things there need someone to help build the church. And behind, you'll see the mission page, right? That lists every single 
partner that you're working with right now to build the kingdom of God. So are there any particular ministries that you want to sign up for to help build the kingdom? And if you say, well, Pastor Carter, I'm already involved in a lot of these things, then my challenge for you is to bring alongside someone else, someone who's not involved. Okay, go say, hey, you're not involved in this. I am. Come. Come join me this Saturday. You know, let's go to um, RVA Hope Center and help folks there. And so be a disciple who disciples. Bring someone else along with you. And then together we can build up the kingdom of God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, you are so good, God. Um, it's amazing a very dry, repetitive list like Nehemiah 3, where it's just names and places, Lord, can have such rich biblical truths in it. You never fail us to, you never fail to amaze us with your word, God. Things that sometimes we just want to skip, but you have so many truths in there to challenge us uh, to be successful kingdom builders. And during this time, Lord, we want to lift up Pastor Josh and his team in Puerto Rico, Lord, that you would bless that trip, that you would bless the pastor there uh, at the church that they're ministering to and the congregation there. Uh, Lord, that you would also, Lord, um, reveal to them your heart uh, for building your kingdom here on earth. That all of us are builders, Lord. You call every single one of us, regardless of our age, regardless of our gender, regardless of our profession, regardless of where we live. Uh, each one of us are called for the Great Commission. And we thank you, Lord, that all this is happening because of the work of Jesus Christ. If he did not come, Lord, to give his life for us, then we would not have life. We thank you, Lord, for the death and resurrection of Jesus. That through him, we have new life in you, Lord. That all the brokenness around us, Lord, can begin to be transformed into your likeness. We thank you, Lord, for this church. I pray for the Way Church. We pray for each family here, Lord, that as they go out this week, uh, Lord, that they may be thinking about what it means to be a builder in the kingdom of God. Give you praises and thanks in the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. On behalf of the Way Church, Thank you for worshiping with us this morning. As a church, we desire to come alongside you on your faith journey to encourage you, to equip you, and to pray for you. So right now, would you let us know what God's doing in your life? You can go online and fill out our Connect card at thewaychurchrva.com. And for those who want to continue worshiping through giving, because we believe that giving is out of a heart of worship, you can do so securely again online at thewaychurchrva.com. And so church, let's go and continue to be the church and love God, love others, and make disciples.